Coming up this week on the GCN Racing News Show, we'll look back at the opening weekend of Umlope Het Newsblad and Kuna Brussel Kuna, crosswinds, crashes, and a cruise to victory for Tali Pogaccia at the UAE Tour. Take a brief look ahead to the Strada Bianca this coming Saturday and make a heartfelt apology for a big mistake we made yesterday. This week in the world of racing, we learnt never to trust Mathieu van der Poel when he says he's going to ride for somebody else. Uh, he was supposed to be at the service of Tim Malier in Kuna yesterday, but then decided to go on the attack with 80 kilometres of the race still remaining. We'll have more on that later on. Uh, but first up, we're going to start with the first part of the Belgian openings weekend, Omloop Het Nieuwsblad. Now, as live coverage started with about 80 kilometers of the race remaining, things weren't split up quite as much as they were at the same point last year. And that really was a taste of things to come. Despite some big attacks from the likes of Matteo Trentin, Tom Pidcock, Greg Van Avermaet, and then Jules Alaphilippe going solo, we ended up with the biggest group contesting the finale of the race since 1992. Did that stop the Koenig Quickstep taking the win? Hell no. Davide Ballerini is on fire this year, and when he kicked inside the last 200 metres, he basically already won the race. So that's five days of racing for him and three wins so far this year. Here is what some of the main contenders had to say immediately after the finish. I, I was trying to follow uh, Stefan and Kevin, and uh, I lost their wheel probably about a K and a half, 1K to go. Um, and then I found Kevin just 500 metres from the line, and uh, yeah, he helped me take the wheel of quick step <clears throat> and in the end uh, I was coming fast but there was just not enough road to, uh, to take Ballerini. After the mood I was surprised it was going to be a bunch sprint and I was, hel I was helping my teammate Tom van Asbroek who is fast but then uh, two kilometers to go he was behind the crash and I lost him and I thought he crashed also so I thought okay I, I just move up and I try to be ninth or tenth for the team so uh, the team can be happy also. Uh, and yeah, I moved up and, and surprisingly there was no fighting, so I moved up more and more. And uh, in the end, I, uh, the two corners to go, I got in the wheel of um, Ballerini. And then I knew, okay, if I stay here, uh, I have a good chance to be on the podium. I'm not the fastest and I cannot follow him, which was uh, true in the end. But um, okay, then, then they still have to come around me. And it's only 250 meters from the corner. So um, in the end, it was it was perfect. I was third, and that was the maximum possible. Great stuff. Uh, now the women's race still had an hour or so to go once the men's had finished. Uh, a good move, in my opinion, by Flanders Classics to keep retention of the audience and put more eyes than ever on the women's event. Now SD Works were the strongest team on paper, and even stronger when it came to the race itself. Uh, they lit things up on the hardhook cobbles, catching the lights of Annemiek van Fleurten and Lizzie Dagen out of position as they forced a split in the race. And from there on, they really didn't put a foot wrong. New recruit to that team, Demi Vollering, was on the attack over the Muir, and when she was caught, it wasn't long before Van der Breggen countered, and once the world champion sailed up the road over the final climb of the Bosberg, the race was basically done. She has clearly started this year with the same kind of form that she had at the end of last, and when Van der Breggen is on form, there's really very little that anybody else can do about it. So, first race, first win for the world champion. Uh, behind her, an elated Emma Norsgaard sprinted to second place for Movistar, proving that they are more than just Van Fleurten, whilst SD Works made it first and third, with former European champion Amy Peters rounding out the podium. So, what did we learn from Omloop Het Newsblad? Well, first up, the Koenig Quickstep are going from strength to strength. Now, I realise that sounds a little bit ridiculous to say when they've been so strong for so many years now, but the way they rode on Saturday, I mean, they could have won that race in so many different ways with different scenarios. There wasn't really a single point in that race where they were on the back foot. Uh, Alaphilippe was the strongest man, you've got to say. Ballerini was the fastest. And with that combination, and indeed the rides they have as backup, it was their race to lose. The lead-out and the tactics in the finale from Askrain and Seneschal were exemplary, something even experienced pros could learn from, I've got to say. Now, the second thing I took home from that race was that the top 10 of the men's looked a little bit like it could have been from 10 years ago. Sepp van Mark, Heinrich Hauser, Philippe Gilbert, I mean, they're all basically my era. And so from that point of view, I was very pleased to see them right up there uh, in the mix in one of the biggest races again. 
It wasn't all the old guard in the top 10 though. In fact, in second place, it was young Jake Stewart, and that really was a standout ride. Whilst his 24-year-old teammate and Luxembourg national champion Kevin Genietz impressed very much too. I mean, not only did he come ninth on the day, but he'd also bridged across to that ridiculously strong group with Tom Pidcock earlier on in the race. Now that, was a seriously impressive bridge by both of them. And I was not at all surprised, in fact, to see that they'd taken the KOM on the uphill drag that leads them to the hard hook with that effort. Now, my third takeaway from the men's race was that Trek Segafredo were absolutely shocking. Uh, their best finisher on the day was the Luxembourg rider Alex Kirsch, who finished outside the top 60. And for a team that I had down as one of the best for the Cobble Classics, that was a bit of a worry. Uh, they would be thankful then that they had another day to make up for it. More on that, of course, coming up later. I also learned why so many of the women's team kit designs looked so damn good and got voted so highly in our hot or not polls earlier on the season on the app. It's basically because they all look exactly the same. I mean, look at this photo taken by Jose Bean. SD Works and Live Racing, you can hardly pick them apart. And even Canyon Strand there in the background doesn't look that much different. I do not envy Marty McDonald and Danny Rowe's job having to pick them out all year on commentary. And finally, I learned that it takes a very special pedalling style to impress Mr Adam Blythe. I mean, just the way she pedals, I think even I'm in awe of it, it's beautiful. Even you! <laughs> even me! <laughs> yeah, let alone you and Si. <laughs> what, what must you be thinking? Oh dear. Even Blythe is impressed with that pedalling style. I must admit I did have a good laugh at that on Saturday afternoon because it was a compliment that also gave us a big insight into how much he raked his own pedalling souffles. Uh, anyway, just before we move on, I'm going to boast. I'm going to take a moment here to highlight my own prediction on Twitter from Friday night. Uh, Ballerini and Van der Breggen as my main picks, Jake Stewart and Maria Confalonieri as my outsiders. I mean, for me, it really doesn't get much better than that, so I hope you'll allow me to gloat for... Um, well, the next decade or two, I think. Uh, right then, on to Kuna, Brussels Kuna. And before I talk about the race, this is where I and we make a massive apology. Uh, so we had a technical issue with GCN Plus, which meant that we didn't have live coverage when we promised that we would, and didn't manage to resolve the issue until we had about 25 kilometers remaining within the race. So my planned afternoon of relaxing on the sofa at home, watching a great bike race was ruined, and I'm sure that that was the case for many of you out there as well. And we are genuinely very apologetic about this. It's not good enough, it's not acceptable. I don't know exactly what the reasons for it were, and to be honest, even if the technical team explained it to me in great detail, it'd been very much over my head. That said, I have been assured that the technical team have already got to the bottom of it, and whilst I can't promise 100% that we won't have another technical glitch in races to come, I can promise you that we are going to do absolutely everything that we can do to prevent another reoccurrence of what happened yesterday. Uh, hopefully you were still able to watch the full replay on demand and long and short form highlights of the race after the finish, which is what I did, uh, where I saw Mathieu van der Poel go on the attack. I mean, you've got to love that man for so many reasons, haven't you? What other big name is going to go on the attack at Kuna with 80 kilometers still remaining to the finish line? Tactically, it's not very astute and ultimately it didn't win the race. But who cares? He doesn't seem to. And for us, it made what could have been quite a formulaic race into something that came right down to the wire. A fair play too, in fact, to Jonathan Navarez of Enos Grenadiers, who went with Van der Poel when he attacked and then seemed every bit his match from then on. Now, Kuna is normally the race out of the two from the opening weekend that does have a decent chance of finishing in a sprint of sorts. And that was, in the end, the case yesterday too. A group of just over 30 fought it out for the win on the day. And making up for a day to forget on Saturday, Trek Segafredo got it spot on. There was a sterling lead out from Jasper Sturban and then Mass Pedersen finished the job off in quite fine style. Uh, he took the win there and with it, the prize of a donkey cuddly toy which he gave to Sturvan, who is apparently a big fan of donkeys. I really wanted this myself, <laughs> but this one belongs to you. <laughs> this is your donkey ride. This is your donkey ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Second on the day went to Anthony Turgis, whilst Tom Pidcock capped off what was a very promising weekend for him with third. 
Team of the day though, for me, was the Uno X Pro Cycling Squad. They had three riders in the top 20 and were in the thick of the action throughout the entire race. Uh, here though, is how they prepared for Kuna Brussel Kuna. No warm weather training camps there. Right then, just before we move on to the UAE Tour, a quick look at what's coming up on GCN Plus over the next few days, if we can get the tech right, fingers crossed. Uh, so first up tomorrow, it's Le Samin in Belgium, both for men's and the women's events. Van der Poel, Sinachal, Cavendish, Degenkolb, Van Marke, Wiebes, Dura, Osking and Bagstedt will be amongst the big names competing there. And in fact, Eleanor Bagstedt's dad, Magnus, a former winner of the race, will be commentating on the men's alongside Jose Bean, whilst it will be Marty and Danny on the women's. Uh, that one is available in every GCN Plus territory. And then we've got a little bit of a break but you're going to need it because things start to get very busy this coming Saturday. It's Strada Bianca Day. I mean, that race needs no introduction. Uh, the white gravel roads of Tuscany will play host to most of cycling's top stars on both the men's and the women's side. It's one of my favourite races of the year, and we've got it in all GCN Plus territories except for New Zealand and Latin America. Van Aert, Van der Poel and Alaphilippe in another three-up breakaway like Flanders last year? You wouldn't bet against it, would you? And then on Sunday, it is the start of the eight-day Paris-Nice, the race to the sun. Now, this is always hardcore racing from start to finish. Uh, it's only available in Europe, plus the Asia-Pacific, except for China, Australia, and New Zealand, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Uh, but other, rate, other providers, should I say, have the rights in those other countries. Uh, also, some very quick news on compatibility with GCN+. Plus. Uh, so the Android TV and Amazon Fire Stick apps are now ready and in your app stores. So if that's how you choose to watch your digital content on your smart TV, happy days. Uh, the Samsung TV app is also ready, but it is waiting on approval from Samsung. And we've got more device compatibility on the way too. Uh, don't forget, you can also use Apple AirPlay or Google Chromecast, or, or indeed our web player, which is at racetv.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Easy for me to say, sorry about the stuttering. All right, let's move on now to the UAE Tour, which was shaped just after last week's racing news show by the Stage 3 Summit finish up Jebel Hafeet. Uh, by far the hardest, in fact, of the two mountaintop finishes of this year's race, so we knew that much of the general classification would be done there, and so it proved to be. Adam Yates of Ineos Grenadiers tried, I mean, he really tried. I mean, there was a point where he looked like he was full on sprinting on a 10% gradient for about a minute. I thought he was never going to stop. But however hard he tried, he just could not get rid of Tadej Pogacar of UAE Team Emirates. And being that it was his team's home race, Pogacar wasn't going to give any gifts either. Uh, he did have a buffer over Adam Yates on the general classification going into that stage, which meant he could defend and sit on all the way up. Uh, but he still went for it at the finish and took the stage win. A solid ride from Joao Almeida saw him finish the day in third on the general classification. And that, in fact, is how the race finished on Saturday. And I think Pugac's rivals have plenty to fear at the moment based on his performance there because there wasn't a single bit of weakness shown, was there? He was up there in every crosswind split. He pulled out a brilliant time trial and there was nobody better than him on the climbs. A masterclass, in fact, from a rider that is still just 22 years old. Incidentally, we also had three bunch sprints, two of those won by Sam Bennett and the final one by Caleb Ewan, uh, those two firmly cementing themselves as the two fastest riders in the world right now. And the difference between them mainly seemed to come down to the skill and power of Michael Merku, who expertly guided Bennett through those finales. I mean, I cannot even begin to describe how hard it is to do that at that speed in such hectic sprints, but the Dane does it with alarming regularity time and time again. Then the other stage, won by Jonas Wienigurt, or Jumbo Visma. Uh, that team actually went there with Sepp Kuss as their leader, but it was Wienigurt who took a stage, and Harper, who was their best on GC with fifth. Uh, we also had two races in France at the weekend, with some big names competing over there. Saturday was the Fon Ardèche Classic, won by Groupama FDU's David Godou, who's clearly started the season in impressive form, whilst yesterday Andrea Baggioli became the first Italian winner of the Royal Bernard Drone Classic, soloing to victory ahead of Darrell Impey of the Israel Startup Nation, with yet another De Koenig rider, Mikel Honoré, in third. That's six wins already for that team this year. 
In other news, ASO last week announced the teams for this year's Paris-Roubaix. Alpes and Phoenix were amongst the wildcard teams on that list, so good news for Mathieu van der Poel fans. Whilst on the women's, we are going to get to see a whole bunch of the world's top cross stars taking part in the inaugural race as the Clismo Mundial have been invited. So Sanna Kant, Céline del Carmen Alvarado, Amory Verst and Yara Castellan could well be in with a chance of victory on the day. I can't wait for that one, uh, particularly in fact having missed those cobblestones of northern France completely in 2020. Right, deep breath, that is all for this week's show. I'm going to be back tomorrow with Cy on the GCN show where we'll be talking about six things we changed about cycling if we could. And I'll be with you on Saturday commentating with Rob Hatch on the Men's Strada Bianca. I'll see you then, if not next week, on the Racing News Show. Ciao.